go on a sideways of the door and just kick it. Plus, a young girl from Harriman critically injured in a car crash. A former first responder jumps in to help. Hear from the man who her mom claims saved her life. And in an update, a deputy responding to a standoff last March, the charge he now faces. Live from Utah's CW30, ABC4 News at 7 starts now. Good evening. Thank you for watching ABC4 News at 7 on the CW30. I'm Lena Takata filling in for Courtney Johns. Tonight we start the show with our top seven stories at 7 p.m. Today, Summit County announcing a former deputy facing charges of manslaughter. According to the Utah County Sheriff's Office, one of their deputies was driving a personal vehicle to a SWAT standoff in Pleasant Grove when Joseph Spencer, a BYU student, was pulling out of a Taco Bell. Summit County says the deputy's truck hit the 22-year-old's car and he was pronounced dead at the scene. According to the affidavit, when asked what happened on the scene, the deputy said he saw Spencer coming and he, quote, shouldn't have tried to beat him, end quote. A nine-year-old Harriman girl will survive this after her dad crashed their car on the way to school while he was allegedly drunk. One man who witnessed the crash is a big part of the reason why. 38-year-old Matt tells us he thought Lily was dead when he got to the car. He says he thought her legs were cut off and he went into paramedic mode, wrapping his jacket around his hand and punching out the window. He says 10 minutes on scene felt like an eternity as he stayed with Lily, reassuring her and talking to her until officials arrived. Can you hear the siren? They're coming for you. They're coming for you. You're going to be safe and try to reassure her and like literally like make her like don't fall asleep again. Don't give up on me. Don't give up. Matt said he doesn't feel like a hero, even though Lily's family says he is. He credits Lily to being a hero because she didn't give up. Lily's mom, Carlene, told us Lily is finally able to breathe on her own and is awake and responding to commands. With multiple youth pedestrian accidents happening within a week, police want to remind people about safety on Utah's roads. Sergeant Spencer Cannon with Utah County Sheriff Department says when driving, especially on busy streets, it's important for drivers to pay full attention. He says some factors that can contribute to accidents like these can be impairment and a lack of awareness. When somebody is impaired, their judgment making isn't the same. Changing the radio, texting or talking on the phone can also distract people from looking at the road. Don't just assume that because you have the right of way in a crosswalk that the traffic that's supposed to yield to you is actually going to yield. He says it's also important for pedestrians to be aware. He says when the light turns green to look both ways and continue looking both ways as you're going. The trial of Jared Baum, the man accused of killing two teens and disposing their bodies in a mine shaft in rural Utah County beginning today. This comes nearly four years after he was first charged. In her testimony, Henderson saying Baum was controlling and abusive during their relationship. She says she invited Powell and Audison over to his house when Baum wasn't home without his permission to have someone to talk to. That's when things went awry. He was angry. Like I could feel, it felt like I could feel violence in the air. Henderson ending her testimony saying she was with Baum the night they approached the mine shaft near Eureka. The defense is expected to question her motive about her testimony tomorrow. As the war in Ukraine continues, universities here in Utah are reminding students and staff to take care of their mental health. Utah State University is making sure its students and staff are doing well. According to officials at the Office of Global Engagement, when a crisis affects one group of international students, they see a ripple effect throughout the campus. The university is reminding students and staff to take advantage of peer groups, counseling, and other mental health services on campus. And officials with counseling and psychological services are reminding Utahns that paying attention to your mental health and stress levels is crucial for overall health. And in our world, the idea of being always busy seems to be valued more or even overvalued at times. And I think when we give ourselves a little bit of grace in those times and say, you know what, no, I don't have to say I'm doing a hundred million things today. I can say, you know what, I'm taking a break. Morales says along with taking a break from daily activities to help alleviate your stress, try unplugging from the world occasionally and take a break from the constant feed of information available online. The end of the 2022 Utah legislative session didn't go without controversy. During the session's final hours Friday night, state, law state lawmakers passed a bill banning some transgender athletes from participation in school sports. 
The legislature passed House Bill 11 requiring Utah schools to designate athletic activities by sex, requiring athletes to play sports based on their sex assigned at birth and not their gender identity. It bans transgender girls from playing in female school sports altogether. Now the bill goes to Governor Cox, who promised to veto it. We have never discussed a ban. Um, I've never had a conversation about a ban with anyone uh, this session. Uh, that was never, in, you know, there were hours and hours, days, months of, uh, of discussion and trying to find that right balance. The governor was aware this bill had gone through several different versions, but said he was surprised the final bill passed. A healthy helping of fresh snow may have caused a mess on the roads, but it's just what our snowpack and our ski resorts needed. This weekend, snowfall dropped as much as 14 inches of heavy, wet snow in portions of the Wasatch Front's valleys and as much as 19 inches in some of the mountain areas. Skiers hit the slopes and droves today at Snow Basin Resort to get in on the fresh powder runs. Despite a lackluster snowpack, officials at Snow Basin say the season wasn't a complete bust and the low temperatures made for great skiing conditions. Skiers we spoke to say the lack of snow this season didn't keep them away from the mountain. We're constantly yep. checking the weather mm -hmm. to see if there's a storm coming in. So. We still yep. come, but we're checking the weather, yeah. hoping it's even better. <laughs> and with more snow on the way, officials at Snow Basin say the March storms are good to help them finish out the season strong. Still ahead with more civilians caught in the cross and the number of people fleeing Ukraine near 2 million. How surrounding countries plan to help. Plus, a monster tornado rips through Iowa, the damage this natural disaster left behind. And we take a live look here outside the doTERRA Salt Lake City downtown. Camera clear skies, but that'll change as we head into the middle of the week. I'll have more coming up in Utah's most accurate forecast. Time now for Utah's most accurate forecast with Caesar Corneo, weather rate certified 10 years in a row. As we take a look here outside the Colonial Flag camera, a beautiful night out with plenty of clear skies, but that's going to change as we have this nice little calm period end for us with this next incoming system. That means more wet weather and also seeing those colder temperatures when we look at the next seven days as well. Do we have a chance to finally clear out some of the snow that we've been getting? Well, it actually looks like, yes, we do have some of those breaks in that weather period for us. But at the moment, looking at satellite and radar, this cold front associated with our next system already making its way through parts of Montana. That will now go throughout Idaho and as well make its way into our area here in the Beehive State, eastern Nevada, as well as southwest Wyoming by the time we get to Tuesday and the middle of the week with Wednesday. Looking ahead at what we can expect besides tonight, 
being a bit on the cooler side thanks to that rush of cooler air. That next system moves in, brings in snow towards the evening hours, which means we could see some impacts to our evening commute. If you have the chance to get out early from work and avoid all of that snow, it's definitely going to help as you can expect to see a slowdown in many areas around the Wasatch Front, especially as you head north. Going towards Wednesday, that's when we'll see some lingering showers, especially in the morning here in the Wasatch Front. It'll continue to move southwards towards parts of the central mountains and southern mountains. And that's why we have, with these winter weather alerts, the winter weather advisories for parts of southwest Wyoming as well as the western Uintas, parts of the Wasatch Beck, the B Wasatch Plateau, Book Cliffs, even the Central Mountains, the Wasatch Mountains, that's where we have that winter storm warning, and even the Wasatch Valleys, Wasatch Front Valleys, that's where we'll have that winter weather advisory still hanging on as well. As we have that snow making its way through, even with UDOT is expecting to see these travel impacts mostly here towards the higher elevations and even in the Wasatch back where we could see heavy snowfall at times. And once we take a look at our snowfall totals, we'll see why. Expecting to see a couple of inches here in the valleys, in the northern valleys, even Cache Valley as well. Benches will definitely do great with this flow and even the northern mountains, Cottonwoods, benefit as well. The higher elevations where we need that snowpack does great. Looking at some of the temperatures for the next few days as well, not terrible as we have a few areas being a bit cooler, but overall not too terrible for us. Regional forecast for tonight and tomorrow, expecting to have those temperatures be on the cooler side as we go to the overnight hours and even warming up slightly but still below average is including in St. George. We don't see the 60s until Wednesday and then cooling down as we head into Thursday. Warming back up by the weekend and even warmer for Monday. Wasatch Front will have that active period for the next few days. By Friday, it'll be cooler but drier as well. And going into Saturday and Sunday, that's where the temperatures will slowly but surely get closer towards normal. And if you want to stay ahead of all this winter weather, well, be sure to download the Pinpoint Weather app on your smart device using the QR codes on the screen or through your app store. We'll return right after the... Oh, excuse me. Lena, over to you. Thank you. Thousands in Hawaii made sick from tainted water, the source of the contamination, and what the government is doing about it next. More than two years after the first coronavirus cases began to surface in America, more U.S. cities, states, and agencies are shifting their response to the pandemic. Today, New York City dropping its school mask mandate and vaccination requirement for businesses. New Jersey making masks optional in schools and daycares. Even though the vaccine is authorized by the FDA for children aged 5 to 17 and strongly recommended by the CDC and Ameri American Academy of Pediatrics, Florida, now the first state in the country to officially advise against vaccinating healthy children for COVID-19. 
a lot of parents have come up to me and they're just like, yeah, well, thanks for not mandating. We want to make the decision. Uh, but they have, they have mixed feelings about whether they, they should do that, even, even if it is their choice. CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky telling 60 Minutes, though the U.S. is not quite at the endemic phase in the fight with COVID, she's optimistic we'll get there, urging Americans to stay vigilant for potential curveballs that could disrupt the country's progress. And today, the death toll from COVID-19 now surpassing 6 million worldwide with infections, hospitalizations and deaths on the decline. The CDC Director optimistic, but encouraging Americans to stay vigilant. I do think that we will get to a place with this disease where we live with a relatively low level all year long and that maybe we have some surges during respiratory virus season. And newly updated forecast model used by the CDC now estimate that nearly 980,000 Americans will be lost COVID-19 by the end of the month. Another solemn reminder, this pandemic is far from over. Now to the latest on the deadly storms and tornadoes in the Midwest. In Iowa, at least seven people have been killed, two of them children. The storm leveling homes and communities, at least 50 homes destroyed. ABC's Rena Roy has the latest. A monster tornado caught on camera ripping through Iowa. Oh the National Weather Service confirms it was an EF4 tornado with winds of up to 170 miles per hour and a path of nearly 70 miles, destroying parts of Winterset just outside of Des Moines. This is, I think, the worst anyone has seen in uh, quite a long time. At least seven people killed, including a five and two year old from the same family. More than 50 homes damaged or destroyed. He wasn't here. My Sun wasn't here. We're all alive. We're all safe. This is all just stuff. Jennifer and Adam O'Neill, who own a flower farm in Winterset, describing the terrifying moments and what's now left behind. We were hunkered down in the basement, and uh, it was the scariest thing I've ever experienced. So our red barn is gone. And we're standing on the foundation of our little flower cottage. This is our event barn. Iowa's governor getting emotional after the devastation, a drone capturing the magnitude. I tried to walk through and thank them for being there, and over and over the response was, we're Iowans, and that's what we do. As the cleanup continues, the area is now bracing for more extreme weather. A winter blast with snow and single-digit wind chills is expected. Rena Roy, ABC News, New York. Red Hill Underground Fuel Storage Facility is the source of a petroleum leak that has left thousands sick in Hawaii. The fuel tanks at the World War II era facility sit above an aquifer supplying water to Honolulu. In November, residents reported their drinking water smelled like fuel. The U.S. Navy found the source of the gas leak, but in December, Hawaii ordered Red Hill be shut down. The Pentagon announcing today plans to close the facility permanently. It is shut down right now. Um, and in order to defuel it, you got to be able to operate it. Uh, and so we have to know what safe operation looks like. We won't get that assessment until the end of April. Once we get that assessment, we'll review it. Uh, we will comply with uh, the requirements. The state of Hawaii asks Red Hill be defueled in 30 days. Kirby says the process to safely bring the facility back into operation and then defuel it will take a year. He says the government is, quote, 100 percent committed, end quote, to getting affected families the medical care they need. And in an update, the Supreme Court quietly announcing today they will not review Bill Cosby's sexual assault case. The announcement leaves in place the Pennsylvania highest court's decision. Last June, the court deciding to throw out the sexual assault conviction against Cosby and free him from prison. A spokesperson for the 84-year-old comedian says he is now considering hitting the road for a final stand-up tour. Andrea Constan, who accuses Cosby of sexual abuse, says the Supreme Court's announcement is an unfortunate outcome for sexual assault survivors. And in Kentucky this morning, hundreds of soldiers at Fort Knox packed their bags for deployment. They're going to offer their support to allies overseas as Russia continues to attack Ukraine. This will be the first time since 2020 soldiers at this base are deploying. The commanding officer explains they hope to send a message of preparedness and solidarity. We're shoulder to shoulder with our, our partners in Poland, in Germany. We've, we're working with Romanians. It is a multinational effort. 
while overseas soldiers will participate in trainings. It's unclear how long they will be in Europe. The wife of one soldier told WHAS 11 in Kentucky she's staying strong for her kids at home and is proud to be a part of the effort to support U.S. allies. After a third round of talks between Russian and Ukraine delegates today, Ukraine says there are small positive signs for safe passageways for civilians out of the country, continued Russian shellings. The U.S. and NATO remain opposed to a no-fly zone over Ukraine, but that hasn't stopped President Zelensky's urgent pleas. ABC's Faith Abube has the latest. Overwhelmed and terrified civilians in Ukraine literally running for their lives as Russian bombs rock one Ukrainian city after another. This man running with a child in his arms, another with a toddler in a stroller, and this man helping an emotional senior citizen to safety. In Irpin, a suburb of Kyiv, Russian projectiles setting fire to the community they once called home. It's like no houses which were not bombed. In the region of Venezia, this video released by Ukraine's emergency services showing crews battling a massive fire at the airport where more Russian missiles destroyed a building. Across Ukraine, the UN has verified more than 400 civilian deaths, but concedes the actual figures are much higher. Russia is starving out cities like Mariupol. It's shameful. Today, after a third round of talks with Russia, Ukrainian officials reporting some positive movements in creating safe humanitarian corridors that would allow civilians in Ukraine to escape safely. But two prior Kremlin promises to provide safe passage were broken. The Kremlin demanding Ukraine formally recognize two separatist regions in its eastern territories as part of Russia and change its constitution to bar membership in NATO or the European Union before they would consider ending the war. Ukraine's President Zelensky, who has called the deadly Russian attacks deliberate murder, responding in this exclusive interview with ABC's David Muir. We are not prepared for ultimatums. And President Biden spoke with the leaders of Germany, France and UK today as the U.S. considers banning Russian oil imports. It's a move the U.S. could take even if European allies who rely more heavily on fuel from Russia don't join in. In Washington, Faith Abube, ABC News. Now, according to the U.N., more than 1.7 million refugees have fled Ukraine since Russia first attacked. Neighboring countries answering the calls for help. Poland reportedly taking in more than 1 million refugees alone. As more Ukrainians leave the U.N. now warning international support will soon be needed. Ten-year-old Anna Maria and her mother were driven out of their home in Kharkiv by bombs. Waiting at a train station in Hungary, she sends messages to friends. I can contact uh, him. They just read my messages and, I, and that's all. I really worried beca and, uh, they, and because uh, uh, I don't know where they are. I just uh, say, hi, where are you? Anna Maria and her mother joined hundreds of refugees heading to the Hungarian capital, Budapest. UN leaders say they're concerned about the next inevitable wave of refugees who likely won't have a place to go when they leave Ukraine. The UN now thinking about a long-term solution. With gas prices so high, would you save money by switching to an electric vehicle? I'm Rich Demuro. I'll have the pros and cons coming up in TechSmart.
With gas prices at record highs, could a switch to an EV save you money? Rich DeMiro takes a look at the pros and cons in today's TechSmart. These high gas prices might have you wondering if now is the time to switch to an electric vehicle. But it turns out the decision involves more than just math. With gas prices at record highs, there's pain at the pump. Historically, whenever we've had a spike in gas prices, people have looked uh, at more fuel efficient vehicles. That means you might be eyeing an EV. Tesla is king, but there are many brands now vying for your attention. Polestar is a full electric brand, owned 50% by Volvo as our strategic partner. There's no doubt you'll save on gas. You're looking at, you know, at least two to $3,000 a year difference in operating costs just for fuel uh, in California. So it, it does add up very quickly. But there's a catch. You'll probably pay more for the EV itself, which is where incentives kick in. Only Tesla and GM aren't eligible for the biggest credits. For a lot of consumers now, you know, it is still cheaper to buy an internal combustion vehicle, but it's not gonna stay that way forever. Other hurdles include charging and range anxiety. Tesla has fast chargers everywhere, while Electrify America, EVgo, and ChargePoint continue to build out their networks of charging stations. Plus, there are still many places where you can juice up for free. So what about the environmental impact? As long as you're not using coal to generate the electricity, any other source, whether it's natural gas, solar, wind, it all works out to a, po a net positive for EVs. Even the batteries can mostly be recycled or repurposed. The big scale of it um, coming back and being recycled, of course, it's a infrastructure logistic question that has to be solved, but where I'm not worried about that, we will solve that. Finally convinced an EV is right for you? Supply chain issues might be your biggest obstacle. If you have a car that's working well for you now um, and you don't need to get a new vehicle, right now is probably not the best time uh, to, to, to make a change. The best part about having an EV is waking up to that fresh charge every morning at home, but road trips definitely require a bit more planning. All right, let me know what you think. You can find me on social media. I'm at Rich on Tech. I'm Rich DeMuro, and you are Tech Smart. For the first time since 2008, the national average price for regular gas is topping $4 a gallon. AAA says in the first full week of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, prices jumped about 40 cents. The record high for the national average is $4.11, set on July 17, 2008, according to AAA. The war is also threatening food supplies around the world. Russia and Ukraine combined for nearly a third of the world's wheat and barley exports. Wheat prices have already surged 55 percent, and there are concerns about supply issues if the war continues. We'll be right back.
live from Utah's CW30. ABC4 News at 7.30 starts now. Welcome back. The jury trial beginning today for a man accused of murdering two teenagers and dumping their bodies in an abandoned mine. Jared Baum allegedly murdered those teenagers back in 2017. He reportedly dumped their bodies in a mine in Eureka. ABC's 4's Ali Aurelian following the trial. She has the story. The trial of Jared Baum starting today almost four years since his arrest for the murder of Riley Powell and Braylon Breezy Otteson, two teens found dead in a mine shaft. Baum's former girlfriend Morgan Henderson, the first to take the stand, accusing Baum of the murder, saying he stabbed Powell and slit Otteson's throat. In her testimony, Henderson saying Baum was controlling and abusive during their relationship. I figured out what I was dealing with, like who I was dealing with, like I was in way over my head um, that this person was extremely dangerous. In the past, Henderson has testified that she did not cooperate with authorities out of fear of bomb. I decided that it was best if I just do whatever he wants and be his number one fan. She says she invited Powell and Audison over to his house when Baum wasn't home without his permission to have someone to talk to. When Baum found out, that's when things went awry. He was angry. Like, I could feel, it felt like I could feel violence in the air. Henderson ending her testimony, saying she was with Baum the night they approached the mine shaft near Eureka. I could see that Riley and Breezy were tied up. Be sure to stick with ABC4 News for the latest information on this trial. You can count on us to bring you all the latest developments, both on air and online at abc4.com. New information, a Utah doctor pleaded guilty to federal charges for allegedly lying so that a rescue helicopter would fly him off the tallest mountain in North America. Dr. Jason Lance from Mountain Green was climbing Alaska's Denali with a group. Lance reportedly made several requests for a helicopter rescue. When told the chopper could not fly at night, rescue teams say Lance then claimed one of the hikers had early hypothermia. The group got down the mountain on their own, but an investigation states the other climbers denied having hypothermia or, or needing help, saying they spent hours trying to convince Lance to hike down on their own. Lance's sentencing is set for March 24th. Nine-year-old Lily Verga suffered major injuries in a car crash last week. Court documents show she was on her way to school when her dad crashed the car, allegedly driving drunk. Tonight, the man who is credited with saving Lily's life is speaking exclusively to ABC4's Jordan Burroughs. Here's the story. Some remnants remain of the car crash that almost killed nine-year-old Draper Elementary student Lily Verga. It's human nature to help someone who needs it. Lily needed all the help she could get. It was on her way to school when her dad crashed their SUV into this tree. Court documents allege he was drunk at the time. What was kind of stressful, I would say, the car could have blown any time. Matt Maillet was taking one of his kids to daycare when he drove by the scene. He saw the wreckage and immediately stepped in. I had a jacket on me, like literally removed a window like this. And at some stage, I had the window on the sideways of the door and just kicked it. Matt says he punched and kicked the windows out to try to get Lily out. You couldn't see the little girl inside the car. He says Lily's body was slumped over with her little terrier named Boomer in her lap and she was barely breathing at first. The former French paratrooper and SWAT officer was there for comfort and first aid. Can you hear the siren? They're coming for you. They're coming for you. You're going to be safe. He says at one point she stopped breathing, but he couldn't give CPR because she was pinned between the seat and the car. I kind of slapped her and said, you're going to come back. You're going to, you know, you're going to come back with me. You stay with me. Come back, come back, come back. And she did come back. That's why Lily's family credits Matt with saving her life. She might not remember my face because she wasn't conscious, but she might remember my voice. Um, I've got a kind of an accent, so she, for sure she will remember that. They say Matt's a hero, but he says otherwise. She's a real hero because she didn't give up. She was inside, trapped, nine years old, with a dog and fighting for her life, and she never gave up. That was ABC4's Jordan Burroughs reporting. Lily's mom says she's finally breathing on her own and responding to basic commands. Matt says he's grateful Lily is alive and doing well and can't wait to meet her. And 513 pieces of legislation were passed in this year's legislative session. Some of the bills passed include House Bill 63 exempting employees from COVID-19 vaccine mandates if they have a doctor's note showing they previously had COVID. 
A new bill now extends bereavement leave for miscarriages and stillbirth. Another recognizes Juneteenth as an official state holiday. One bill expands mental health services for first responders, and lawmakers gave Utahns nearly $200 million in tax cuts. Earlier on GMU, we spoke with the director of Utah's Hinckley Institute of Politics to break down what came out of this year's session. And we have a reminder to anyone who plans on voting in this year's primaries. You only have until the end of this month to make sure your voter registration is up to date. This includes your name, mailing address, and politi political party affiliation. To check our update your information, just go to VoteUtah.gov or you can go in person to your county clerk's office. And here in Utah, some universities are reminding students and staff to take care of their mental health while the war in Ukraine continues. ABC4's Northern Utah correspondent Cade Gardner sat down with Utah State University officials who say that message applies to everyone during the current crisis. As the war in Ukraine continues, officials at Utah State University are paying close attention to the needs of their students. With the Ukrainian students, the Russian students, were concerned about their mental health. Janice Bettinger says as war broke out, the Global Engagement Office reached out to those students first. We have found with past crises that if one international student group is impacted, there is a ripple effect. It'll ripple through the entire um, international student population. The university offers a range of services to students and staff. And as the uncertainty surrounding the war grows, there are techniques you can use too to help alleviate stress. There are uh, ways to sort of retreat from the press of the world, if you will, uh, and that would be things like uh, you know, seeking quiet places, meditation, uh, trying to get away from that hubbub and, and the incessant, I guess, flow of information at times. Taking a step back, James Morales says, is nothing to feel guilty about. And that's related to this idea of, um, yes, it's still happening, but shelter yourself a little bit for a, a bit of a respite, and that allows you to recharge your batteries. In Logan, Kate Garner, ABC4 News. Still ahead on tonight's Justice Files, why one man convicted of hiring men to kill his wife could get a second chance if a judge considers new evidence.
A major step towards a new trial for a man convicted of arranging his wife to be murdered. In 2000, Paul Allen was convicted of making that arrangement, and his appeals have been rejected. But there's a new effort to reverse the conviction. For every crime, there's a story, and the truth matters. Here's ABC4's senior crime and punishment correspondent Marcos Ortiz with tonight's Justice Files. This latest effort by Paul Allen for a new trial began in 2016. Recently, a judge had an opportunity to dismiss the case, but surprisingly, he wants to hear the so-called new evidence. In 1996, Jill Allen was found dead in their Woods Cross apartment. Someone had beaten her to death with a baseball bat. Her husband, Paul Allen, was questioned and considered a suspect from the beginning, but there wasn't enough evidence to bring charges. A year later, two men, Joey Wright and George Taylor, confessed. They took a plea bargain in exchange for their testimony that Allen hired them to murder his wife. In 2018, Allen spoke with ABC4 about the trial. I, I was sick of it. I, it, it, it's, I, I didn't even know how to, how to take it. It was the hardest thing to be, you know, uh, I had confidence in the system. And my attorney kept giving me all the confidence in the world that everything was going great. But that confidence was shattered when a Davis County jury convicted him of aggravated murder and sentenced him to life in prison. Since his conviction, Allen has appealed several times, but each time they've been rejected, including one that reached the Utah Supreme Court. But Allen's attorneys have since learned that Taylor has been telling others in prison that it was a botched robbery and Paul Allen didn't hire him at all. In a recent hearing aimed at dismissing the case, the Attorney General's office called it hearsay and it shouldn't be allowed. Numerous people testified at trial that they heard Mr. Allen request the death of his wife. That would have to be weighed and balanced with the hearsay, hearsay statement from other prison inmates the state claimed all that was available during the trial, and they should have presented it then. But Allen's attorney says this information is different because it came to light while both Taylor and Allen were in prison. There are six persons who say that Taylor told uh, them that Paul had nothing to do with the murder. And Taylor's the one that was convicted of doing the murder. The judge ruled that those statements by George Taylor are newly discovered and ruled that the case will move forward. But he also made it clear he's not saying those statements are true and it will be argued at a future hearing. For the Justice Files, Marcus Ortiz, ABC4 News. And as we continue to see a calm sky out there, things are changing for us. I'll explain what those are coming up in Utah's most accurate forecast.
Time now for Utah's most accurate forecast with Caesar Corneo, weather rate certified 10 years in a row. So a very nice and calm kind of night for us as we continue this Monday here from Park City Mountain. Not seeing much in the way of cloud cover. A great way to have a little bit of a break between these next incoming systems. And yes, this calmness does end as we have that system making its way in, bringing that colder air and some wet weather with it. And do we see any other dry periods to give us a chance to play catch up and remove some of this snow from our driveways? Well, it looks like it will be yes, but before that, again, this one system will move on in, bringing in that colder air and wet weather. Seeing some high elevation snow in parts of the eastern highlands over in, in eastern Idaho. But for us here in Utah, not seeing much, just maybe a little bit of cloud cover over top of our mountains and just really hanging around. But let's look at the timing of this next system. When we get towards Tuesday morning, over towards the southeast highlands, the Caribou Highlands here in parts of Idaho will start to see some snow making its way in, as well as some of the higher elevations in eastern Nevada. By the time we get towards lunchtime, that's when we'll start to see a little bit of that moisture making its way towards the central Wasatch Front. And as we go into the afternoon and evening hours, that's where we'll see it pick up a bit more causing some issues for us during that evening commute. So definitely, if you can avoid driving at that time, make sure you can. As we go into the overnight hours, starts to fill in a little bit more, and it'll continue moving towards central Utah, even into our morning commute. So that's something to keep an eye on as well. Looking into parts of the evening time for Wednesday, you can see some high elevation showers for parts of central and southern Utah, but then it really starts to dry out and colder air starts to take hold for us. As we look towards our alerts, we have a winter weather advisory for many areas, including the Wasatch Front Valleys, parts of the western Uintas, also in the Wasatch Plateau and Book Cliffs, and then even the mountains. Look at that winter storm warning due to the snow that we are expecting. That starts Tuesday morning, continues until Wednesday evening. We do have some impacts expected, especially in the higher elevations. And when we look at the snow totals, it makes sense. Look at that. A couple of inches here in the valleys, even the benches, northern mountains do well, as well as the cottonwoods thanks to that northwesterly flow. And even some of the, some of the central and southern valleys can end up seeing a little bit of some snow. Then again, we see the temperatures really cooling down, and that's what we do have for the next few bits of, of course, the temperatures for our overnight lows tomorrow around the 20s and even some 30s for parts of our area, especially in northern Utah. But in St. George, we'll stay a bit warmer, drier towards the end of the week and even heading into the weekend with temperatures warming closer towards the 70s by at the time we get to Monday. Wasatch Front, we'll see that active period continuing for us Parts into Wednesday and even lingering with some high elevation showers for Thursday, then drying out by the time we get to Friday and Saturday. Stick around for more after the break.
You're watching ABC4 News on Utah's CW30. Thanks for joining us on the 7 p.m. news on CW30. Coming up at 10 on ABC4, Utahns doing what they can to help Ukraine. What some people are buying overseas to try and give back. And one South Australian zoo is celebrating the birth of two cheetah cubs. The park just released this video showing the mother and her babies. The cubs were born a little over a week ago. The park reports that the cheetah mother has been very loving and attentive to her cubs, who they say have been seen rolling around and cuddling together. Oh, that's just so cute. It's so adorable. <laughs> and one good thing is we start to see the return of some wet weather here in parts of the Wasatch Front. 40 degrees will be the high in Salt Lake City. Again, PM snow is expected, possible com commute issues, and a 56 in St. George for us. Thanks, Caesar, and thank you for watching ABC4.